Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Nuttall. I'm an editor at The Economist based in London. And I'm joined by Carl Bildt, who, as I'm sure you all know, is a former foreign minister and prime minister of Sweden, um, high representative in Bosnia, and currently serves as, among other things, co-chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a post from which um, he has been doing a lot to help bolster Western support for um, Ukraine's struggle against Russia, um, which will be the theme of our discussion today. Um, and we're going to be talking about the extent and the shape of Western support for Ukraine. And I thought we might divide this discussion into two parts. Um, what the West has been doing, is doing, and will continue to do to support Ukraine's military effort. And then, when, at some point, we will reach a point at which um, the reconstruction, the post-war reconstruction will begin. And of course, there will be an important role for Ukraine's Western allies at that point. And I thought we might get into some of the details of what that might look like as well. Um, but Carl, maybe we can start by talking about where we are. Um, we know, or we expect, a, uh, a large-scale Ukrainian counter-offensive at some point in the coming weeks and months. We don't know when, we don't know exactly what it will look like. But what are the implications when the West is thinking about the military, as well as the economic and diplomatic support that it's been providing for Ukraine? When Ukraine begins its counter-offensive, and in particular if it begins to make some of the gains that we saw um, last autumn, what are the implications for how the West should maintain its support for Ukraine under those circumstances? Well, I don't think that we would see a repetition of what we saw in September, because that was a collapse of the Russian front. I think the Russians have, um, the Russians are not entirely stupid. Uh, they have taken lessons from that. They have adjusted the way that they use their forces and command their forces. And they have fortified themselves in a way that was not the case in September of last year. So that's not going to be repeated. Um, we all have our hopes that a counteroffensive will be more or less successful. But I think we have to be sort of fairly moderate in our expectations. The, uh, lesson I think of this war so far is that the defense is easier than offense. I mean, the Ukrainians have been extremely successful in their defense efforts. Uh, the Russians have as well when they concentrated on defense. Um, so let's see. Um, important is, of course, to keep up uh, the support that we give them. Uh, there are problems, particularly on the ammunition side, as has been sort of widely reported in the newspapers. And uh, we have all of the ammunition factories that are around in Europe and in the US, working at full speed and trying to increase the rate of production. But these things take time. And they're getting those ammunition of different sorts, by the way. We both have the Soviet calibers and we have the Western calibers. Getting to the, them to the forces takes time. Then, in terms of support, I'd like to stress, and I think that's often forgotten, uh, because a lot of the focus is on the military stuff, the ammunition and tanks and God knows what that is needed. But we also need to have very solid financial support. Uh, there's a need for, you see different figures, it goes up and down, three, four, five billion dollars slash euros a month to keep the Ukrainian state operating. I mean, hospitals, teachers, policemen, administration, and to prevent them from the necessity of financing that by printing money, because printing money is hyperinflation, and hyperinflation destroys a society. So keeping the sort of the structures of the Ukrainian state functioning, the cohesiveness of the Ukrainian society going by financial support is equally important, I would say. As, uh, as the military one. Um, while we are at the military side, just one remark on what I think is the uh, slightly underreported uh, is the, the spectacular failure on the Russians. Um, what we can say now, perhaps with some certainty, is that the effort that has been there since roughly January, when Putin made the last big uh, change in the command um, and, and brought forward all of those that he had mobilized in September where he did that big, big change, um, is that the Russian attempt to go at offensive had failed. Uh, they really tried. They really tried. Uh, wave after wave of soldiers, both these sort of what you've seen in the media, Bakhmut and Wagner, what, but also attempts to more 
competent offensive operations in certain areas, leaders all fail. And uh, this is the, comes at the same time as we see another failure, which is fairly spectacular. Um, had um, someone said to me in September that uh, what you will now see is that the Russians are going to launch a thousand cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, a thousand or more than that, to destroy the power infrastructure of Ukraine, I would have said they are highly likely to succeed. Uh, now we can say they have essentially failed. Uh, so their sort of the initial war failed. Um, their sort of missile attack failed. Their mobilization, the new army that Putin tried to create of the failure of the first army has also failed. They are now digging down in defensive mood. Uh, and that is, of course, if you look at it in a longer perspective, an absolutely massive failure uh, from what used to be the second biggest military power in the world. Um, and that should give us a certain room for optimism long term. And I think you can probably say as well, to, to add to the litany of, of Russian failures, at least so far, a Russian hope that um, they would have a greater degree of strategic patience than Ukraine's Western allies. So I think clearly there was a hope that um, it would be a very difficult winter for some European countries. The Russians were strangling energy supplies, obviously. There was a hope that countries like Germany, like Italy, might start to waver in their support. Now, that hasn't happened, and I think most observers have been uh, struck by the remarkable degree of unity inside Europe. The transatlantic bond has clearly been renewed. NATO is expanding, possibly including your country. The question, though, is how resilient is that unity going to be? We have a lot of people starting to think, of course, about the next American election and what would happen if we see a return of Donald Trump to the White House. But even in Europe, you know, there, presumably there comes a point at which p parts of some population start to waver in the supply of financial help, of military help. A lot of countries have cost of living crises. Is there a point at which the hope in the Kremlin that Western support for Ukraine will waver, hope that hasn't yet come to pass, will be something that we'll need to worry about? Um, that, that is clearly something that they are, that they are hoping will happen. Uh, but as you say, so far not. Uh, I think, at least to the surprise of myself, um, in the ECFR, we've done a couple of big opinion polls across Europe to look at this. And what we've found is that support for Ukraine has gone up. Um, and there could, of course, be a couple of factors, but those factors, I think, are of enduring importance. It didn't turn out that we were freezing to death, more or less. Uh, it didn't turn out that sort of the cost of living crisis, as bad as it is, got worse. And if we can look forward to being able to manage the energy situation in the next winter, and what we see now, it looks fairly okay, or slightly more than okay, I would say. If we have a situation, and that's a big if there, that food prices continue to come down, um, if we have a situation where oil prices don't go through the roof, it means that the strain in European societies that we were afraid of are not going to be increasing. Then it's up to the political leadership. Then it's up to political mm -hmm. leadership. And next year is, of course, going to be sort of a massive election year all over the world. We have European Parliament elections. We have UK to take in all the country. We have, uh, uh, we have the Russians are having elections, by the way. Um, yeah, sort of. <laughs> they should not be discounted entirely. Uh, because I think they are or President Putin wants to have an election result that looks decent. I mean, he can't take them by police to the sort of polling votes, all of them, 140 million people or however many of voting age. It, he, he needs to engineer a vote, a result in the Russian parliament, sorry, in the Russian presidential election that looks <laughs> semi-decent. And I think he's slightly worried about that. So we have elections are going to be extremely important next year. Just before we turn to the post-war situation, final question on the, um, the counter-offensive. There, there have been some analysts who have wondered about a point at which 
Western aims or interests and Ukrainian interests might start to diverge. So far, as we've been discussing, they have remained more or less in lockstep. But if we say, though, you, you were expressing some skepticism that this counteroffensive might yield huge territorial gains. But let's say, for example, that the Ukrainians are able to break through, break the land bridge between the Donbass and Crimea, take Melitopol, mm -hmm. um, and this starts to create a huge domestic crisis in, in Russia, um, the, the second big reversal of the war. There are going to be some voices in Europe that are going to say, once that's done, take the win, start to, to the Ukrainians, start the negotiations from a point of advantage, make it clear to Putin that there is no way for him to regain this territory without bringing wave after wave of costly mobilizations. The Ukrainians, of course, will want to regain every inch of their territory and, are, and have shown clearly that they are prepared to incur a lot of loss in order to do so and will continue to do that. Is there a moment at which there could be such a divergence of interest between the West and the Ukraine that that alliance that has remained so strong so far could start to, to weaken? It could be, uh, but I don't see it. And I think the risk of that happening within the sort of foreseeable future is fairly small. I mean, it is there, but I think fairly small. I think the key thing that we must aim at, um, obviously what's going to happen at the battlefield is fairly decisive. But even more decisive is what happens in Moscow. So far, I mean, go back to where we started. Putin probably is sad to all of the people around him. And all of the people around him, as we know from that famous, famous meeting of the National Security Council, enthusiasm for this particular war was nearly non-existent around him. But he probably said that I'm going to win over the Ukrainians and got to be very smooth. That's roughly what he was probably listening to Western intelligence agencies that said roughly the same. That did not happen. Then he said, well, the Europeans are going to, they're going to be weak and the Americans are not going to sustain the fight. So he's been able to say all the time to the people around him and to sort of the Russian political elite, just give me some more time. Um, I will succeed. They will give up. At some point in time, um, if there's a significant setback on the military side, if the political will in the West stays up, I think we will see the beginning of some turmoil, change, tension, adjustment in Moscow. And at that particular time, uh, then I think, what do we do then right. in terms of negotiations? So far, the issue of negotiations is not an issue because Putin has no yep. interest whatsoever. There isn't the slightest sign uh, from Russia. There, there, there have been attempts, some of them unknown, and there are a couple of track two things that people are trying to initiate. But it doesn't get any traction in Moscow whatsoever. But at some point in time, I think, uh, the, the, the Putin bunker will start to break. And the question is what we will do then. And I think that might well be a fairly, fairly dynamic debate, yes. to put it in those terms. One way to describe it. Let's, we've only got about 10 minutes left. Let's turn to the question of post-war reconstruction. Of course, we don't know when this will come. We don't know uh, what the state of the country will be when no. this, needs to, um, this needs to begin. But of course, it's something that we've been starting to think about already. Um, and there's several elements to this, but I thought I might ask by starting with the, uh, start by asking you about the institutional one. And here I'm thinking about Ukraine's bids to join the European Union on one hand and, and NATO on the other. Um, the EU bid, Ukraine achieved the status of an official candidate country last year, along with um, Moldova, um, something that I think would have surprised a lot of people if they'd been told if that that was oh, going yeah. to happen even a few months earlier. Oh, this yeah. is clearly a big diplomatic win, but it's only a first step and a very, very long journey, and there's now a big hope that, um, uh, that those negotiations can begin in earnest this year. NATO, it looks a little bit more wobbly, and, and there's a lot of discontent in Kiev about um, the mixed messages, to put it mildly, that they have received from the Alliance about their bid to join. Um, that will be presumably dis one of the big topics of discussion at the Vilnius Summit um, in a few months' time. What's your sense of the relative importance of these two institutions in helping provide Ukraine with sort of institutional anchors that it will need as it begins to get up on its feet after this war's over? Well, they, they, are, they are both necessary, they are complementary. I mean, whether it's NATO membership fully or not, but I mean, the security of the place is important. Because all, for all of these, sort of, we talk about the number of billions going into reconstruction. 
But as we've learned from the transition in Central Europe, key at the end of the day is get the FDI in. And FDI is not going to come in if they think there's going to be bombed to pieces okay. tomorrow. So it's only when there is the full security, or more or less full security, as much security as we can get, for Ukraine that the, on top of the physical reconstruction that we, we taxpayers in the West are going to help with, we'll get the FDI, we'll, which will really get the no. Ukrainian economy going. So they are dependent upon each other. Of course, the security is going to be dependent not primarily on papers being written, it's going to be primarily dependent upon us helping them to set up a viable, strong, credible defence, uh, an air force, an army, a navy that can mount a credible defence against any temptation from the Russian side in the foreseeable future. If that is within NATO fully, if it's with bilateral arrangement with different countries, that's important but not critical. The critical thing is the strength itself. Yes, so security guarantees that, take, that may take a different form from Article 5, in other words. It could, it could. I mean, uh, there's sometimes a couple of parallels, as I'm discussing the parallel between the United States and Israel, yeah. uh, where there, there's new, no alliance, no guarantee whatsoever. Uh, but the Americans have a commitment to at least supply yeah. the Israelis uh, with uh, very advanced weaponry, and even an amount of money. And it's perfectly possible to do the same arrangement with X numbers of countries. And uh, I think there's an understanding in Europe that the defense of Europe uh, is the defense of Ukraine. Yeah. So we have a self I've, I've, I've also said, I don't think you're allowed to say it in NATO, we are not yet members of NATO, so I can say it. <laughs> um, I would be perfectly prepared to take this 2% gold. Take, take 0.3 off that. And, 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 and give that to Ukraine. Because if you take 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 of the GDP of NATO and give it to U Ukraine, it's a hell of a lot of money. And that will be more effective for defense no. against Russia than any additional spending in the Portuguese or Norwegian or, or, or Luxembourg armed yeah. forces, I would argue. Is it conceivable that Ukraine could join NATO when it doesn't enjoy full sovereign control over its own territory? Yes, I think it is. Um, absolutely. Um, there's often pointed out the fact that West Germany was a member of NATO. And uh, it did claim sovereignty of some sort over the EDR. It didn't accept the EDR anyhow. So, yeah, it can be done. But you did have, of a form, you did have internationally recognized borders back then. Well, you did. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the GDR had political representation that... Um... It then took some time, but at some point in time it did happen, yes. But I, 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 I think well, one can... Uh, I don't think that's going to be an insurmountable okay. uh, objection. And with the, when it comes to the EU bid, um, it already, Ukraine's bid to join the EU already feels different from some of the Central European countries that did so. There's clearly a sort of a political impetus behind this, which is why they were able to obtain candidate status last year and now hope to, to begin formal negotiations. What's your sense of the sort of political balance of power inside the EU when it comes to advancing the bid as, well, perhaps not as quickly as Kiev would like, because that's not going to happen, but advancing the bid at a faster pace than other aspirant countries have been able to achieve? I think there's still that support, uh, and we should not forget that that political support is very important. Take, take this sort of <laughs> the historical example of Greece. Uh, if you remember, when the, the colonels were thrown out of here. I was a bit um, too young for that. But sorry. Yes. I, I don't quite remember it. But, no, uh... <laughs> but it did happen. <laughs> sorry. Um, and, 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 and the Greeks said, we are a democracy, we want to be members of the European Union, and we want to be fast. The Commission said, no way. Uh, you are not ready for it. You don't fulfil even the most elementary criteria. You are not competitive the way we're so recommended against it. And the European government said, could be, but this is a question that goes beyond that. It's a question of safeguarding democracy after it had thrown out a dictatorship and thereby sent a signal that was very important also when it comes to what happened then in Spain and, and Portugal. Yeah. I still think that political support for Ukraine is very strong. But, of course, then we go into all of the, the weeds of all of the details and we've seen what's happening these very days with uh, very competitive ag Ukrainian agricultural food yep. exports.
creating some sort of domestic turmoil in uh, some of the countries that otherwise are supporting Ukraine yep. the most. Yep. It took, um, I, 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 I remember going back to those particular accession negotiations when Spain then threw out Franco, or he died to be precise, um, then those accession negotiations started. Those took eight years. Mm. That was not because there were any major problems with what the Spaniards were trying to do and it was not a major problem with the Commission either. It was French farmers yep. who fear Spanish farmers. So we'll have, to, we'll have to overcome quite a number of those issues because we will have a major economy entering, an economy that is potentially very competitive, particularly in the agricultural sector, that will cause turmoil and will cause the need to do significant changes yep. in structural funds and in agricultural policies of the European Union. And that is normally something that leads to something that is very close to civil war in Brussels. Yes. But that being said, it will happen. Um, a final question, because we don't have much time. Um, I, I wrote an article about Ukrainian refugees in Europe a few months ago, and one thing that emerged clearly from that is that a country that even before the war was facing severe demographic yeah. difficulties, um, even by the scales yeah. of, um, um, of Eastern European countries, clearly that's been um, accelerated and accentuated by the massive outflow of people, almost all of them women and children, since the beginning of the war. The longer that the war goes on, the longer that people who have left the country will put down roots in Poland, Germany, wherever else it is that they've gone. And then, of course, the crucial question is, men of military age are not currently permitted to leave Ukraine. When that rule is finally lifted, some of those men will want to leave, to join their families, to seek ec economic opportunity in a country that isn't ravaged by war. How significant a difficulty do you think this demographic problem might be for Ukraine if it loses a lot of its best and brightest who see better prospects abroad? I think that is one of the, the two major problems that might be there, but so far, but, but so far, um, I think it's worth noting that immediately after the beginning of the war, there was this massive refugee wave out. And I remember, I can't remember, but I was that I think three or four months after the beginning of the war in Kiev, and you could really see that the, that the, 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 the city had thinned out quite yeah. substantially. Uh, when I'm back now, I can't see any change. Now, I haven't been there for two months, but I had a friend who was here, and she said she was coming from Kiev, and she said, now we have traffic jams back. <laughs> so we have had a substantial number of people who went out who have gone back. Um, so, positive sign, still, uh, that, is, uh, that is a danger. That, uh, uh, which was already there in the beginning, by the way, uh, before the war, because if, if, if you were a bus driver in Kiev and could get substantially higher salary doing exactly the same sure. thing in Warsaw, speaking more or less, not the same, but speaking a similar language, the t temptation was there. So we need, to, we, we need to be aware of that. The other danger, just to mention that, is um, um, that they, after the end of the war, that they're able to do a transition to a truly democratic political culture. Uh, the political culture in some of these countries, including Ukraine, has been less than perfect in terms of over-centralizing and not tolerating opposition and those sorts of things. I hope that the Ukrainians, all of them have learned that that is not the way to go and that uh, the quality of the democracy of Ukraine will be extremely important in sustaining the necessary political support for the enormously complicated but vitally important accession process. Let's hope so. Carl Bildt, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.